So hi everybody, um, welcome to MIA. We're gonna have a session today on machine learning for the 3D genome. Um, I'm really excited to introduce our uh, first speaker. Uh, but before I do that, I'll just make a quick announcement that um, you know we're a very interactive session, so I encourage you to ask questions. But if you do, please um, either get a mic passed to you or come up to the uh, one of the mics there. Uh, so everybody can hear you on the Zoom. Okay, so our first speaker today is uh, Rochi Zak. He's a uh, Eric and Wendy Schmidt uh, fellow here at, here at the Broad Institute. Um, and uh, he's done some really pioneer, pioneering work in his PhD um, in uh, graph representation learning for uh, the 3D genome. Um, at, and who did that at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and so, would you please take it away? Uh, okay, uh, let's get into it. Uh, uh, thank you, Salil, for the introduction, and thank the organizer for this uh, great opportunity to uh, present my work related to utilizing graph representation learning to study 3D genome organization. Uh, so, first thing first, what is 3D genome organization? Uh, okay. uh, one important a uh, phenomenon that a lot of biologists observe and also trying to answer is that uh, virtually all cells in our body would share the same copy of DNA, but they result in various different cell types like neuron cells and muscle cells. So uh, how does this same copy of D uh, DNA or genome instruct the development of these various different cell types? Depending, uh, depending on who you ask this question, you might get complementary but uh, different answers. Uh, people are going to say it's transcriptivity, chromatin accessibility, methylation, histomodification, etc. Uh, but essentially, these are all like one dimensional signals along the genome that kind of uh, give you a different state of the chromosomes. But one important aspect that often got neglected is that the genome is not linear. Human genome, which it, which is about two meters long, are folded into compact 3D genome structure, 3D structure and packed in this teeny tiny cell nucleus. This results in complex chromatin interactions or DNA-DNA interactions. To capture these chromatin interactions, uh, there have been a lot of technologies developed. One example would be this uh, high throughput mapping method called HiC. Uh, the figure here shows a general idea of what a typical HiC experiment would look like. Uh, we would use this technology called proximity ligation to ligate a pair of genomic loci or a pair of DNA that are close to each other spatially uh, or having an interaction with each other. Then based on high throughput sequencing, you would get these uh, high C contact frequency map. Uh, or for those of you who are more familiar with graph theory, it would be something similar to the adjacency matrix where each row and column corresponds to a fixed size genomic Beam, and the entry corresponds to the interaction frequency between these uh, pair of genomic beams. So these captured chromatin interactions by high c actually characterizes multi-scale 3D genome features. Uh, one example would be these uh, 3D genome features illustrated here called AB compartment. So in general, we can regard A compartment as relatively more active chromatin region. So those are regions with high GC content, more, more enriched with genes or genes with more active transcription activity. And B compartment are relatively inactive regions. So in the high C content map, uh, if you zoom in, you will see this checkerboard-like pattern, which indicates the switch between A compartment regions and B compartment regions. Besides AB compartment, there are also other uh, types of 3D genome features, such as topologically associated domains or TADs and loop. And these are what they will look like in the high C content map. For the TAD, it will be these, uh, well, the, the bottom figure here, it's like the top high C content map, you rotate it by 45 degree and only keep the top part because it's a symmetric matrix. So the TAD would be these uh, oh, no. densely connected regions in the near diagonal part and loop would be uh, those long range interactions. Um, so uh, these 3D genome features, they uh, contribute largely a lot uh, to the uh, regulation of gene transcription activity. So it decide, contributes a lot to decide what genes to express and also the amount of gene expression, which ultimately affect the cell type. 
and disruption of 3D genome features would lead to phenotypical change or even human disease. Uh, the figure here shows one example of the change of the test structure leads to uh, some phenotypical change of uh, the number of finger you have uh, on your hand. So getting back to the question of uh, why the same copy of DNA could result in different cell types, one major contributor is actually the variation of 3D genome structures across different cells. This variability of 3D genome structures cannot be directly reviewed by the aforementioned HiC technology, as in the HiC experiment, uh, interactions across all cells, they're pulled together to do the experiment. So to review the uh, variability of 3D genome structures, multiple new technologies have been developed. The first type of technology focused on what uh, it is called multi-way chromatin interaction which represents simultaneous interactions among multiple genomic loci. Uh, there has been a lot of uh, like a different types of multi-way chromatin interaction capturing method. Uh, the figure here shows one of them. Uh, so the brief idea is that now, instead of proximity ligation, we would get these chromatin complex, which contains uh, two or more than two genomic loci that are interacting with each other then we try to barcode each chromatin complex and demultiplexing based on the barcode. Um, and with high throughput sequencing technology, you would know that along the genome, these three or multiple genomic regions, they are having a simultaneous interaction within the same nucleus or not. The second type of technology instead folks uh, is called single cell high C. So for single cell high C, it still captures pairwise interaction, but in individual cells. So to make it easier to understand the relationships and differences of these different technology, uh, I'll make an analogy of something we're experiencing every day and uh, even now, which is the Zoom meeting. So for bulk high C, it's something that it records the frequency of two people having a Zoom meeting, uh, having a Zoom meeting. And for multi-way chromatin interaction, it instead records if a group of people are meeting at the same time, maybe attending the meal talk uh, or not. Uh, for single cell high C, it still records if two people are meeting or not, but it also records the session ID associated with each meeting. And with this session ID, you can actually trace back to answer questions such as, are these three people attending me at all or not? So these new technologies are generating new types of data, but computational methods that can make full advantage of these data are significantly lacking. Um, due to the sparse, uh, sparseness and uh, noise level of these data, traditionally people would just turn this multi-way chromatin interaction and single cell high C back to the original bulk high C format and reapply existing algorithm on that. And uh, I think that kind of loses the uh, advantages of this new technology. And as a result, uh, the uh, variability of 3D genome structure and its functional uh, implication remain mostly unclear. So besides chromosomes, there are also other components in the nucleus. Uh, there are various type of uh, nuclear body which results in interaction between chromatin and this nuclear body. And there are transcription factors which results in interaction between uh, DNA and these transcription factors. So uh, integrating all these components, put them in the uh, spatial coordinate and study the interaction among them with DNA is the central theme of 3D genome. Uh, which is also very challenging. So to cope with these challenges, uh, my approach is to model them as graphs. Specifically for, uh, we can model each genomic loci as a node, and then we can model the genomic features as uh, various type of node attributes. We can model the uh, uh, different types of interactions as heterogeneous edges. And for DNA multiple interaction, uh, we can model it as something called hyperedge. Uh, I will give a formal definition later, but just in brief, edge connects two nodes and hyperedge can connect more than two nodes, which can be used to represent higher order interactions. And finally, for the cell to cell variability, we can model it as different views of the graphs. Combine all these together, we would result in a multi-view heterogeneous hypergraphs. So uh, that's a quick. Uh, clarifying question. So when you talk about the nodes as a uh, position, do you mean like actually one base pair or do you mean like a region? Like a region. Okay. Uh, but theoretically you can do one base pair, but 
in practice, we usually do like a fixed size region uh, for just like more robust analysis and computational complexity, et cetera. Yeah. Okay, and what, what okay, so yeah, just, is is the what is the approximate size and are they overlapping the regions or are they um they're oh. usually fixed size window uh so not overlapping and the size can typically go from uh one kilobase up to one megabase that's usually the range great thank you so much thanks um to give you an idea of what this graph representation would look like here i show the network representation of the aforementioned high c data uh, in the right bottom part. And you can already see the uh, connection or association between some of the 3D genome features I introduced and the network topology. So in this talk, I will mainly cover uh, three of my latest work. Uh, first, I will introduce uh, this work called HyperSegon, which is a general framework for hypergraph representation learning. Uh, which is further extend to Higashi, uh, which is like an analysis framework for single cell 3D genome. And lastly, I will introduce how we improve the scalability and interpretability of the deep learning Higashi model with our latest fast Higashi. So first, uh, I would like to introduce some of the key concepts that I briefly mentioned and will be frequently mentioned uh, for the rest of the talk. So I think we are all familiar with the concept and uh, idea of graph or network, which used to model pairwise relationships. Uh, in many real world problems, uh, relationships among multiple instances are key to capture critical properties. Uh, for instance, we have the co-authorships among multiple authors, and we can have the heterogeneous events such as human location activity. To model these higher order interactions, we can use something called hypergraph. So formally, a hypergraph can be defined as two sets, the set of nodes and the set of hyperedges, where each hyperedge can connect two or more than two nodes. Uh, depending on the type of the nodes in the hypergraph, a hypergraph can be classified as homogeneous or a heterogeneous hypergraph. Uh, depending on the size of the hyperedges, it can be defined uh, classified as uniform or non-uniform hypergraph. So in this work, HyperSagon, we aim to develop a generic representation learning framework for hypergraph. Uh, we specifically trying to focus on these, I think the hardest type of hypergraph to study, which is non-uniform heterogeneous hypergraph. We think a representation learning framework should fulfill these two goals. First, it should be able to generate node embeddings for the nodes in the hypergraph. And second, it should be able to learn a function to predict whether a of nodes would form into a hyperedge or not. Based on these goals, uh, the model is required to have the following key properties. First, it should be able to take verbal sized node tuple as input because we are trying to tackle non-uniform hypergraphs. And second, it should be able to model non-linear relationships among the nodes because in real world, these relationships are usually non-linear. Uh, and lastly, the model should be permutation invariance or partial permutation invariance because Let's say the model is trained to predict whether uh, Tom, Katie, and Jason are going to be friends. If you input the model with Tom, Katie, Jason, or Jason, Katie, Tom, the model should give you the same output. So permutation invariance. So uh, with these requirements in mind and motivated by prior uh, work in natural language processing, uh, specifically speaking, the transformer model, which is now deployed in the uh, chat GPT that everyone level hates. Uh, so we developed the architecture hypersecond here. Uh, the input to the model would be this node tuple with their node attributes from X1 to XK. They would first pass through a position-wise speed forward neural network to generate what we call static embeddings. Uh, as the name suggests, it's called static because the static embedding of a node I depends solely on the attribute of the node I, and it represents the general properties of a node. On the other hand, they pass through a multi-head attention layer to generate what we call dynamic embeddings. And as the name suggests, uh, it depends not only on the feature or attribute of the node itself, but also on the feature and attributes of other nodes in this node tuple. And it represents the uh, properties of a node when it's involved in a hyperedge or a node group. After that, we calculate pairwise distance between each pair of uh, 
static and dynamic embeddings, and we turn that into probability score uh, by times minus one and also a sigmoid function. Uh, and finally, we average these probability score to get the final probability score, which indicates the probability of these node tuple forming into a hyperedge. So uh, to make it easier to understand, essentially hypersegon is constructed based on one assumption that each node needs to deviate from its general properties to form a hyperedge with other nodes. This amount of deviation is characterized by these pairwise distance term here. And a hyperedge would only be stable if this amount of deviation is relatively small for all its node members. If deviation is too large, the hyperedge would, dis or would, would be disruptive. Um, so now let's get into this multi-head attention layer. So we use a slightly different. Go, go back to the previous. So um, let me just check that I understand the, um, so at each time you put in input some nodes and you're trying to predict whether these nodes form an edge. Yes. And so the, the amount of deviation um, is dependent on all the other nodes that were input. So for each right. node, you get a deviation amount, but it, that depends on the set of nodes that were input. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, this deviation is calculated with both dynamic embeddings and static. Okay. Static is like the same for the node across all hyper edges or node group. Dynamic depends on its neighbors or contacts. Uh, so, great. Thanks. Um, so now let's get into this multi head attention layer. Uh, so, we use a slightly different version of self potential mechanism than the original one introduced in the uh, uh, transformer model. Specifically, we exclude the uh, RFII self loop attention coefficients. So, by this design, our model actually shares similarity with the uh, continuous back of word model or the word to back model. So in that natural language processing model, the neural network is trained to predict the target word given its context as input. So in our case, uh, the static embedding would be the target word while the dynamic embedding embodies the context or the hyper edge context. Um, so we tested this uh, hypersegment model on four benchmarking hypergraph data set and we observed 4% to 50% of improvement on hyper edge prediction task. And more importantly, this modified self attention mechanism consistently improved the final improvement or the convergence speed of the model. So after building this powerful uh, hypergraph representation learning framework, we then applied it on the heterogeneous uh, hypergraph reconstructed for 3D genome. And one example would be the study of single cell high C. I think this group of audience might have seen this analogy over the past five, six years too many, too much, but uh, bear with me. Uh, so for bulk high C, it's something like this cup of smoothie that it only represents the consensus or average pattern of the genome structure, but it loses the variability among them. For single cell high C, they are like these individual uh, berry that they would reflecting individual chromatin structures like these. So if we turn this 3D genome structure into the uh, pairwise distance map, they would look like these. Uh, if the single cell high technology kept evolving and uh, sequencing become cheaper, people willing to sequence deeper, this could be what we directly get from a high single cell high experiment. But for now, these are actually what we get from the single cell high C uh, experiments. And if you see nothing, uh, that's correct because there is nothing here. Uh, so, uh, our goal for single cell height analysis is two part. First is that we want to recover the missing information during this process. And second is that we want to utilize this sparse single cell height content map uh, to generate embeddings, cluster the cells, and ultimately annotate cell types based on them. Uh, there are a lot of challenges when trying to fulfill these two goals. There are obvious ones, such as the high dimensionality, sparseness, and noisiness of the data. And also, as compared to other single cell one dimensional assays, 3D genome uh, has extra degree of freedom and hence it's intrinsically more dynamic. And lastly, very recently, we have co assayed single cell high C or multi omics single cell high C 
meaning that for each single cell, we not only have these sparse quantum map, we would also have another sparse one dimensional signals as well. So um, in this work, HyperSeg, and we're trying to tackle these challenges by model the single cell high C data as a hypergraph. Specifically, uh, we have two type of nodes. Uh, we, would, we have the cell node, which corresponds to each single cell, and we have the bin nodes that correspond to each genomic loci. And every non-zero entry in the original sparse single cell high C content map would be represented as a hyper edge connecting the corresponding one cell node and to be known. So with this design, we can observe that actually the analysis goal we propose for single cell high C analysis is equivalent to the goals we propose for hypergraph representation learning. Specifically, now learning the cell embeddings become equivalent to learn the node embeddings in the hypergraph. Uh, impute the sparse content maps become equivalent to predict the missing hyper edges in the hypergraph. And for joint modeling of coercive signals, we can achieve so by uh, training the neural network with auxiliary task of utilizing or predict these node attributes. So uh, now I will introduce the neural network architecture we used in Haigashi. So we incorporated our developed hyperseconding framework into Haigashi. Specifically, now the input node tuple is always going to be these triplets of one cell node and to be node. And the output uh, probability score would indicate the probability of uh, observing a context between being J and being K in the cell I. Uh, but slightly different from the original hypersecond framework, we change the structure by utilizing these cell dependent graph neural network. Uh, the advantages of this design is twofold. First, uh, with this graph neural network, we increase the expressiveness of the model. But more importantly, it allows us to coordinate imputation of single cell high C content map across different cells. Uh, what do I mean by that is uh, when now when calculating the dynamic embedding for cell I in J being K, uh, the input to the cell dependent graph neural network would be this graph constructed by weighted sum of the content map of the cell I, as well as content map of the neighboring cells to the cell I in the embedding space. So these neighboring cells in the embedding space are cells that likely to share similar genome structure. So them sharing information with this cell would help with the imputation. So one thing you might notice is that now these contacts, they're used both as the input to the cell dependent graph neural network but also used as the target to predict. So there can be potential information leakage. Uh, to avoid that, when calculating the dynamic embedding for cell I being driven K, we explicitly make sure that we would remove the edge between being driven and being K in this cell I. So with this design, uh, our Higashi model is essentially trained in the self-supervised learning scheme. The bin that, mode is a locus. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? The, the bin node is a genomic locus? Yes, the bin node is the genomic locus. And you're assuming that each cell has one nucleus? Each cell would have uh, one nucleus. Uh, yes, that's the assumption now. Thank you. Oh, cool. thanks. Is there a mechanism in the fully connected layer to have different embeddings for cell nodes and bin nodes? Or is it supposed to, is there like explicit architecture in there or is it supposed to learn that by itself? Um, uh, there is not like a specific design architecture for the uh, cell node. It's just fully connect, a fully connected layer. Okay. Good. The same network that's input, both the cell node and the bin node. Uh, they uh, the structure is slightly different because of uh, obviously they have different input feature dimension, but they are both fully connected new year, uh, la fully connected la uh, layer and so same hidden dimension, same activation function, but the input feature dimension is different. Okay. Yeah. But then the weights are different, right? Because if they are two different networks, those those weights would be different. Right? Yes. Okay. So then that lets you learn differently. Got it. 
Right. Uh, my question is, how large is the graph and how many edges are there? Because it seems like you have maybe thousand, hundred thousand cells, and uh, each cell has how many beans? Like maybe at least hundred. So the uh, more than will yeah. be a lot, right? Um. Okay. So one thing is that for this single cell high C data set, we first only kind of focus on the intra chromosome interaction. So we only focus on the interactions within chromosome one. Um. So that if Let's say for chromosome one, if you choose to study at one megabase resolution, we have 250 times 250. If it's 100 KB, then 2,500 times 500, uh, 2,500. But also uh, because single cell high C is super sparse, it's a sparse graph. So uh, even though the graph is large, it's for the graph neural network, the computational complexity is still relatively low because it's sparse. Yeah. So in practice, what is the, like, you know, at the moment, the standard, like, what's the number of um, nodes that's permitted, like, by the current technology? Um, you mean, like, the largest? Uh, or, like, the smallest bin size that's actually reasonable? To we've use. tried 10 KB. Uh, we haven't tried smaller, not because the model cannot handle it, but more because the data doesn't show enough pattern. But yeah, uh, another thing I would like to highlight is that if you go smaller bean size, usually people not, not usually, but it's very people doing it, but uh, we will usually look into near diagonal part. So that would only limit the number of potential interaction you could look at. So there are ways, strategies to not actually do the exponential part. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so. So saying uh, Higashi is actually trained in the self-supervised learning scheme. So we would, so the training scheme is essentially first mask out the edges between bin J and bin K in this cell I. Then we would try to reconstruct it uh, by utilizing the rest interactions in this cell I, as well as interactions in its neighboring cells as input to help reconstruct this uh, mask out edges. So we first uh, tried to evaluate Higashi's imputation power. Sorry to keep interrupting. Um, but the features for each um, node, are they the sequence of the node or is it um, just like a static embedding for each node? Uh, or... That's a good question. Um, so in the future, we would very likely to, uh, uh, to incorporate sequence feature or other feature, but for now they are just like a, big hash table, like a static embedding for the model to, to learn. Yep. So we first, we try to evaluate Higashi's power to impute the uh, sparse single cell high C content maps through a realistic uh, simulation experiment. Uh, specifically, uh, we utilize these uh, 3D, like the imaging data uh, from this bin to add all science data uh, paper. So for this, uh, image and data, you can regard it as these uh, 3D polymer models uh, shown here. So we would first turn these uh, 3D polymer models into pairwise distance map, which is marked as ground truth. We then randomly sample interactions uh, from the, uh, based on that, like in proportion of the inverse of the distance, also following the power law and certain cutoff to generate the sparse content maps, which are marked as raw here. After that, we apply different imputation methods on that, uh, and we quantify the imputation accuracy as the similarity between the imputed map versus the uh, ground truth map. To highlight the uh, advantages of using neighboring, neighboring cell information, uh, here we uh, in include uh, imputation results with Higashi that with or without using neighboring information. What we observe is that without using neighboring information, uh, Higashi can already outperform the baseline method. And by utilizing the neighbor information, the imputation accuracy can be further improved with uh, clearer defined domain boundaries. So to get an idea of why using neighboring information can be helpful, here we visualize the cells that uh, help with the imputation for these cells and cells that are further risked in the embedding space. And we can see that uh, for cells that lend a hand, they do look very similar to this cell, which explain why sharing information with them is uh, helpful. So 
NBR. Oh, NBR is a uh, abbreviation for neighbor. So zero neighbor and co-neighbors, yeah. I think I was, maybe there's a stupid question, but um, is the thing you're trying to predict the ensemble averaged distance map? Uh, no, it's the single cell distance map or single chromatin structure distance map. But you only have one sample per cell. Um, you actually have two because there are two copy of, but the idea is the same. Yeah. So from just two samples per cell, um, you're able to recapitulate the ensemble average in time of that given cell contact map. Um, it's not map. ensemble time. It's just uh, the snapshot. Like I, uh, I would give like this is used as the ground truth, like the distance map. We generate simulated data by sampling interaction from it, and then we try to reconstruct this one. Uh, and we think this process may make the actual single cell high C data pretty well. In the single cell high C data, you get one cell and you record just a few contacts yes. from each cell, maybe even just one, right? Uh, not really. For okay. singles, you still get a lot of contacts per cell. Okay. Yep. And you, you try to reconstruct the 3D genome structure of that cell. Okay. The, um, the ground to each cell, there's not a heterogeneity across cells in the um, ground truth. Whereas in the biological sample, there could be heterogeneity. Uh, there, oh, you mean for each sample? But this for is a cell sample. type. It's not this particular cell. It's a cell type. Mm -hmm. It's a cell type. So but, how is this different than just doing a normal high c experiment with um, cells? So still, uh, OK, so the figure I show here is like, one cell example with uh, different read coverage, but within this data set, we still have like tons of different structures. So it's the same cell line, but the 3D genome structure is highly variable. So there are still different, very different uh, content maps or distance maps we get, and we try to recover them. Oh, so one cell, the, the ground truth is for what? Just it's one. just one cell. Oh, yeah, okay. but as an example, the ground truth here, I only show one cell, but these furthest cells and neighboring cells, they are also. Uh, content maps from this data set. And they, at least for the further cells, they look very different to this specific cell. Okay, thank you. Thank did, you compare, did you compare this to just training a model on the ground truth as images? Sorry, can okay, you okay, repeat the question? Uh, just training a model on the ground truth as images and trying to regenerate them as a comparison. Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Uh, we haven't done that, but uh, we know there are other researchers that try to do that using like a variation autoencoder approach on the imaging data. Uh, I think it can be complementary, but yeah, we haven't done that. Thank you for the question. Um, okay, so where was I? Okay, now we evaluate the uh, imputation accuracy of Higashi. We next applied it on a real and more complicated single cell high C data set to study. Uh, which is this snm 3 c sick data set consisting 4,000 cells from human prefrontal cortex. So um, one uh, essential challenge for this data set and single cell high c data in general is that can we differentiate uh, cell types or cell subtypes using the 3D genome information only? So traditionally people have done that using one dimensional single cell arrays such as RNA single cell RNA stick, single cell methylation, et cetera. But we don't know if 3D genome has enough information to differentiate them. And this data set would be a great data set to benchmark on because the snm 3 c sig is actually a coasted single cell high C with methylation. And all the labels in this data set is actually annotated using a well-established pipeline for single cell methylation. So we can use that to confirm that if 3D genome uh, can actually resolve the cell types that are consistent to methylation. So uh, the UMAP here shows the results from Haigashi embedding where the red box highlights the neuron cells of this data set. Before Haigashi got published, uh, all other papers studying this data set said that there are just no, not enough information in 3D genome to resolve neuron subtypes. 
but uh, we are one of the first to show that you can actually separate the neuron cell types using only single cell high C uh, with our method. So uh, the next question is like, okay, we know Higashi can separate neuron subtypes, but what are the 3D genome features that it's capturing that results in the separation of them? Uh, you cannot just give me an embedding set, you did a good job, also tell me why. Uh, so at the start point, we look at the single cell AB compartment values we, uh, I introduced before. So recall that uh, I'm, I briefly mentioned that in the content map, you see these checkerboard like pattern, which indicates the switch between A compartment and B compartment. So based on that, we adapt the AB compartment calling algorithm at, to single cell resolution. And that would give us a matrix of the number of cells times the number of genomic spins in the genome. And uh, each entry would be a value that indicates the likelihood of this genomic region being a compartment for this specific single cell. We visualize this with UMAP, and uh, we see that by using single cell AB compartment value alone, it can already resolve most of the major cell types and have some power in separating the neuron subtypes as well. So naturally, uh, the next question is like, okay, we know single cell AB can separate the cell types, but which regions of these single cell AB compartment values that separates them? Uh, as a start point, we look at the uh, single cell AB compartment values near the marker genes for these cell types. So the marker genes are genes that are known to be highly expressed in a specific cell type. And we want to uh, explore if they would also show uh, some association. So to do that, we first call top 200 marker genes for each cell type based on single cell RNA-seq. Then for each single cell, we calculate the average single cell AB compartment values for this set of marker genes. And the results are, um, the results are uh, visualized uh, in the heat map where each row corresponds to a set of marker genes and each column corresponds to a single cell. Uh, can uh, can we okay. uh, get to the uh, question? question? Yeah, about just just quickly about how you define the AB compartments in the data. Did you perform PCA? Uh, yes. Okay. So that's a good question. So traditionally, what people do to define AB compartment at for bulk high C is run PCA on the normalized bulk high C data and take the first principal component. Usually, people define like a, a arbitrary threshold above zero A compartment uh, above zero, A or B, below zero, the other one. Uh, we do not directly do that for each single cell because if you do that, uh, so for PCA, essentially you are finding a projection uh, space to project high C to one dimension. If you do that for individual cells, the uh, PC1 of each cell, they're not in the same space and they're not comparable. So in Higashi, instead we calculate the projection matrix from the pseudo bulk high C, and we use that projection matrix to project each single cell, so to make sure they are comparable. And we do not binarize them into A or B, because uh, the threshold of zero may, might work for bulk high C, but for single cell high C, why not zero? It can also be 0 0.1 or negative 0 0.1, so we just keep the continuous value as a feature. That's a good question. Uh, okay. So, we inspect it like the association, and we found that in general, we would observe higher single cell AB compartment values around the marker gene for a specific cell type. Uh, for instance, the astrocytes cell here would have the highest single cell AB compartment values for the marker genes for astrocytes. So this shows the direct association between 3D genome features and transcription activity. But more importantly, since the marker gene transcription activity is commonly used for annotate single cell high C data set, uh, this association shows great uh, potential of just using the single cell AB uh, compartment, va uh, compartment values calculated by Higashi to annotate future single cell high C data set without any coassate signals. Roji, uh, what does it mean to say higher single cell AB compartments? Like, is it just you see A compartment signals more strongly, or do you also see B compartment signals more strongly, and what does the latter mean? Okay, so uh, higher single cell AB values means that uh, this region is more likely to be in the A compartment. Uh, so just like a likelihood of this region B being active. Okay, got it, thanks. Thanks. Okay, so 
uh, I introduced, so just before, uh, just in the first part of the talk, I introduced Higashi, which is this new algorithm that basically provides these two functions. First, it generates more informative cell embeddings, and second, it can impute the sparse content maps more accurately. With these two functions, uh, we it enable us to identify the uh, cell types on complex tissues and also uh, enable us to characterize 3D genome features at single cell resolution. But as a deep learning based method, Higashi is far from perfect. It still suffers from a lot of the uh, limitations, but is also shared with other single cell analysis methods. <clears throat> First is that uh, the discriminative power of Higashi's embedding on single cell high C is still not as strong as other single cell one dimensional arrays. So we should generate more, even more informative cell embeddings to facilitate real cell type identification. And second, as a deep learning method, Higashi lacks interpretability. We know it gets give us good embedding results, and we try to show that it captures some of the uh, single cell AB compartment features. But we also notice that the UMAP of single cell AB does not look as good as Higashi embedding. So what are the extra 3D genome features that are captured by Higashi uh, that results in the better results. So the interpretability could be much improved if we can directly associate uh, cell type to cell type specific 3D genome features. And lastly, uh, over the recent years, we see more and more single cell high C data sets uh, of more cells on complex tissues being generated. So the scalability of the method is also very important. To address with all these issues, I'll now introduce our very uh, recent method called uh, fast Higashi. So uh, the essential idea of fast Higashi is instead of hypergraph, now we modeled uh, the single cell high C as multiple three-way tensors. So one dimension would correspond to the cells and the other two dimension would correspond to the gen genome coordinate. And motivated by prior works of applying matrix decomposition on single cell, uh, on single cell RNA-seq, we uh, developed fast Higashi based on tensor decomposition. So the, fi uh, the figure on the right hand side here shows the general idea of tensor decomposition, where we aim to decompose a tensor into products of matrices and tensors, which are usually low rank. Um, so now, getting back to fast Higashi, for a single cell high data set, let's say we only have one chromosome, we would decompose it into two factors the cell embedding factor and the and the uh, the interaction pattern factor, which we refer to as chromatin uh, specific meta interaction. So one problem occurred. We definitely have more than one chromosomes, and different chromosomes have different sizes. So how to model them jointly? So we adopt this model called Core Perfect Two, which aims to model multiple tensors with unmatched features. So these can be uh, single cell high data set from different chromosomes. So now we will decompose it into four factors. We have the cell embedding factor that are shared across all chromosomes. We have the, again, chromosome specific meta interaction. But now we also have the chromosome specific transformation matrix that transform the cell embedding to chromosome specific cell embedding. And we have the beam weights combined with meta interaction to capture the interaction pattern. So these two extra factors here, they're used as the bridge between single cell, uh, between cell embeddings that are shared across all chromosomes and uh, single cell high data set from different chromosomes. To mitigate with the sparseness of the single cell high data set, uh, we adopt this commonly used imputation algorithm called, uh, okay. uh, one thing I also need to mention is that uh, another, I mentioned the scalability is really important. So we implement the method in a mini batch training style such that during training, only a small fraction of the content maps from a small fraction of the cells are fetched from the data set, densified, and train the model. And this allows our uh, model, like data set of any sizes, to be fitted into a GPU device to accelerate training. So we try to mitigate the sparseness uh, with uh, a random work with restart imputation algorithm. One problem, the most straightforward way to do so is to just impute all the sparse single cell high C map at once, then run tensor decomposition on those imputed maps. However, after imputation, uh, these sparse content maps become much, much denser, which is the point of imputation. But it's just infeasible to store all these dense uh, tensors in memory. 
So uh, instead, we propose to run the random walk with restart during the training of tensor decomposition. Then when problem occur as we are doing mini batch training and we only see a small fraction of the content maps and random work with restart requires to be run on the whole graph. So instead we use these, uh, we develop this algorithm called partial random work with restart. So we would first slice the sparse content map based on the mini batch size. We then calculate the local affinity matrices by dot product similarity. We would then run random work with restart on these uh, local affinity matrices and combine with the original sparse slices to get the enhanced content maps. As compared to the original random work with restart that runs on the whole graph, here it only runs on the local affinity matrices, which is much more efficient. So with all these effort, uh, our implementation of fast Higashi makes it the fastest and most scalable uh, single cell high C analysis method to date. It achieves 10 times speed improvement than its predecessor and can be run on CPU or GPU with reasonable runtime. So uh, we know that fast Higashi, as, just as its name said, it's fast. So what about the performance? Uh, it doesn't make sense if it's fast, but gives bad embedding results. So we benchmark it on three single tail high data sets from complex tissue, and we observe that it consistently uh, achieves the best power in separating the cell types. But one extra thing we noticed is that on this uh, tiny at all deep sea data set, the advantage is not that obvious. So one thing to clarify is that I mentioned that these two data sets are M3C6 data set, they are co -assayed. The cell type label is defined by methylation, something that it's well established. But for these DIPC data set, um, they don't have coassay signals. It's just single cell high C, and their cell type label is annotated using another single cell high C analysis framework. So we took a closer look at the data set, and we found that fast Higashi is actually penalized because we are separating the uh, clusters that are annotated as the same cell type, but fast Higashi are separating them into smaller clusters. One example would be these two clusters of neonatal neurons, which we mark as neonatal neuron A and B. So the next thing we want to do is we want to show that these smaller clusters, they are actually something new, some, new something new in biology, like they are neutral cell types, not just some random artifacts that Bob Higashi to pick up. So how do we show that? Uh, recall that in the last part of Higashi, I mentioned that for future single cell high data set without coassay signals, single cell AP confirmation values can be used to annotate cell types. So that's what we did here. Uh, we calculate the um, excitatory neural marker genes and the, inhibit the single cell AP confirmation values near the excitatory neural marker genes and the inhibitory neural marker genes. And we observe a significant uh, uh, differences among these two groups. And based on that, we can confidently annotate these two clusters as inhibitory neonatal neurons and excitatory neonatal neurons. We repeat this process for other smaller clusters we observe, and we would result in a much more refined cell type annotation on this data set than what they did in their original paper. So next, we use Fast Higashi to integrate this deep sea mouse brain data set with another mouse brain data set from visual cortex. The point to do so is that uh, this visual cortex uh, data set contains uh, neurons from mouse that are 14 days to 21 days old. This period is very important for brain development, but it's mixed in the first DIPC data set. So uh, the uh, neuron cells that are marked with light green that are shining here, they are the visual cortex neuron. So based on this integration, we were able to recover the development trajectory of the uh, mouse brain. Uh, we found that this identified trajectory agree well with the age of the mouse, but more importantly, it uh, also show that our refined annotation of cell type is actually correct as the neonatal neuron we marked as inhibitory neonatal neuron is now connected to multiple branches of mature inhibitory neurons through the identified trajectory. And the excitatory neonatal neuron is connected to multiple branch of excitatory, uh, mature excitatory neurons. So after Fast Higashi got, got published, we also see a lot of new uh, single cell high C data set that can really highlight the advantage of Fast Higashi. Uh, and here I show one of them, which 
this paper is still on bioarchive. This title at all bioarchive paper uh, on human developing mouse, uh, human developing brain, uh, which contains about forty thousand cells. So we made a comparison of the embedding we get from fast Higashi and the original embedding uh, from their paper. And fast Higashi runs much faster, also generates much better embeddings. Uh, we also compared at another resolution at one hundred KB resolution still much faster and better embedding results. And that's what I see that inversion that with this uh, scalability, fast Pegash can really facilitate future single cell height analysis at atlas level. So, okay, I'll briefly summarize. <laughs> okay, so I introduced fast scale Higashi, which seems to give you uh, better embedding and also is much faster than Higashi. So do we still need the original Higashi? Uh, what's the point of running something that's not as interpretable and slower? So from my point of view, fast Higashi is not developed to replace Higashi. First, Higashi's imputation power is still much stronger than the random work with restart algorithm uh, we used in fast Higashi. And second, due to the underlying connection between uh, tensor decomposition and hypergraph representation learning, fast Higashi can be regarded as a quasi-linear version of Higashi and thus can be utilized to initialize the neural network of Higashi. We tested that idea and we found that uh, by initializing Higashi with fast Higashi, we can even achieve better embedding results, uh, resolving almost all neuron cell types, subtypes in this data set. There are multiple future directions to improve the Higashi and fast Higashi due to time limitation. I'll not go through that. Uh, and so in this talk, I introduced the Higashi software suite. We have the Higashi version one and also fast Higashi. Another important aspect is the visualization of the data. We developed this tool called Higashi visualization. The key point is that it allows synchronized navigation of embedding results with content map. If you click one cell, you can see it's content map. So you actually see what are the pattern that the uh, embedding method is capturing. We also generate a gallery of all the available single cell HIC data sets. So if you're interested in single cell HIC analysis, check this out, it lists all the available data sets. And this is our GitHub repo. So finally, I would like to thank my PhD advisor, Jema, where I, it's in his lab that I got to do this line of uh, exciting work. Uh, I would like to thank the co-author of this work, uh, the collaborators for their helpful uh, suggestions during the development of these algorithms. Uh, and finally, uh, I started as a postdoc at Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center at the Broad, uh, starting from last September, co-advised by Bonnie Berger and Jason von Resro. Uh, thanks to them, I'm enjoying my time as a postdoc and got to continue to do this exciting line of work and also explore uh, new opportunities. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much for that uh, great, great talk, Ruchi. Um I, I think we have just one, uh, we have time for just uh, one quick question. Um, but yeah, any other questions we'll uh, um, save for the discussion uh, where both speakers will, will join us afterwards. Yeah, I have a simple question. Uh, what does this look like with like X inactivation? Um, because my understanding was you have two samples for your chromosome, but it's known in female samples. One of them is highly condensed versus the okay. other. So that, that confound your your model or does is that captured? Okay, um, so all the results I showed today, we just doesn't look at X chromosomes, but uh, there has been other method to study the X chromosome, like the inactivation, the dense, yes. So in principle, it can be applied, uh, but I would say maybe you need to run like a phasing algorithm to know the paternal copy and maternal copy first, but yeah, good question, thank you. I'm really excited to introduce our, our next speaker, Bo Xia, uh, who's a fellow at the Harvard Society of Fellows um, and here at the GRO, where he just started his own group. Um, in his PhD at NYU, he worked um, on some really uh, fundamental um, uh, results um, uh, in uh, gene regulation and evolution of gene regulation, um, and has won uh, numerous prizes for uh, that work. So. I'm really excited to hear what he's got to tell us today. Um, thank, thank you both. Thank you, Slea, for uh, inviting us for, um, for this presentation. I hope my voice is clear. Um, is it? Great, thank you. 
And also, um, thank you, Rochi, for the for the very good introduction of the high C, which also makes my presentation much easier uh, because I can save some of my time for the for the introduction part. Um, so um, today, uh, I'm going to present our recent work on how we can use predictive machine learning model to help us discover new gene regulation, uh, uh, new genome organization, uh, genome organization regulation. So I'm going to uh, lay out how we develop the model and how we uh, using the predictive model to uh, propose a new framework for in silico genetic screen to identify those new regulations. So, um, um, thank you, Rochi, for the uh, for the introduction of the genome organization. I'm gonna very briefly go through it. Like the interface genome is organized hierarchically organized in the nucleus. Um, the different chromosomes occupy the uh, different territories in the nucleus. Those are typically in the tens or hundreds of megabits this kind of size. And these uh, chromosomes can be on um, um, again like uh, divided into A or B compartments as active or inactive compar uh, compartments. These are like usually hundreds of kilobits or tens of uh, megabits, this kind of size. And within these com compartments, you um, uh, if we zoom into the to the uh, to the uh, to the genome to the chromosome, we will see uh, a structure called a topologically associated domain which is typically hundreds of kilobase to um, tens of kilobase, this kind of size. And if we zoom in even further, there will, uh, will see a lot of like chromatin or uh, chromatin regulation, like histone modification, DM methylation. These are uh, happening, um, you will see the signal and the hundreds of base pair, this kind of resolution up to single base resolution, such as DM, DM modification or DM methylation. So the regulation is uh, of the genome is at uh, multi uh, layers, and uh, the abnormalities happen to this different layer. Um, so the abnormalities happen to the genome at, across different scales. They could cause diseases, such as in cancer. Um, people see very frequently like a chromosomal uh, a chromosomal copy number gain or loss. Which is a word called uh, alloploidy, um, and the uh, and the compartments level on the chromosomal uh, rearrangements or inverting or loss or um, duplicating. This kind of um, uh, chromosomal changes can lead to the compartmental changes. Of course, it will um, lead to the gene expression changes, and the TED uh, uh, structure level, like the TED structure uh, fusion or fission, this can um, leads to aberrant gene uh, gene gene regulation including both activation or inactivation of the key genes. This can all co cause diseases. Just now, Roche has given a very, very uh, canonical type of um, disease in TED structure changes that can cause to the uh, limb, uh, sorry, the finger development uh, abnormalities. And even go further, like uh, to, the, to the, for example, nucleotide level uh, abnormalities, mutations to the transcriptin factor binding sites that could lead to the apparent uh, activation or inactivation of gene regulation and the single nucleotide level. So in my group here at the Gene Regulation Observatory, we are trying to um, aim for the, uh, for the mechanisms and principles of genome organization regulation. So we're trying to develop tools to, that can study the important and challenging uh, questions in this field. And we use these tools to uh, characterize the biological function of uh, DNA elements and the new, uh, new regulators of the genome. And, and with these uh, biological insights, we want to understand their regulation uh, mechanism and how the genome is uh, regulated underlying uh, development, disease, and evolution. Um, so for, for, the, for the genome organization, uh, part one very milestone technology is called high c that can help us understand the overall uh, uh, architecture of the genome this is a work uh, pioneered uh, by uh, Eris Aiden and in the group of uh, uh, in the group of uh, job Baker and um, Eric Lander here so um the high c technology is uh, is a as I said it's a milestone technology then we really analyze the, um, the proximity, like using the proximity ligation to see how frequent the two pieces of DNA is interacting with each other. To so cross-link the genome, let, the, and let them to freely uh, ligate with each other. And then you analyze the junction site of the um, ligated um, DNA sequences. So then, to, uh, so then to count how frequent uh, two, uh, two pieces of DNA are interacting with each other. So with this high C technology, people clearly see the hierarchical organization of the genome. 
like across the different uh, different chromosomes, they are uh, overall um, forming uh, its own territory where the interaction is much higher within the chromosome compared with the interchromosomal uh, interactions. And if we zoom in into individual uh, chromosomes, uh, we will see just now we mentioned the A or B compartments, where A compartments are the active ones, they tend to um, uh, uh, tend to form um, very closely with each other, even though they may like physically, uh, even though they, uh, in the linear uh, perspective, the chromosome, they might be far away from each other. And if we zoom in further, like um, we'll see the topologically associated uh, domains, which is the TEDs, um, that that's within the individual TEDs. That's where the gene regulation is happening most frequently. Like for example, we heard a lot about the enhancer promoter interaction. Those are typically happening within the uh, TEDs. So that's a part we want to know more, know further about how the gene regulation is happening. Like what kind of enhancers are interacting with a specific um, promoter of a gene, so then to activate or inactivate uh, genes. So. Um, um, th th this um, this approaches this technologies has already enabled our um, the big picture understanding of genome organization, and we also understand from the mechanism side on um, the most fundamental and um, most important mechanism is on um, the CDC facilitated um, the loop extrusion mechanism by the uh, cohesion complex, where the cohesion complex is loaded to the chromosome, which eventually um, extrudes the DNA. And they are stopped by the uh, CDCF, um, CDCF binding sites where when two CDCF are bind in a head-to-head -head kind of uh, orientation that defines uh, the boundaries of the, of the uh, TEDs. So this gives us the uh, big picture of how the genome is organizing. Um, and um, and you, you might hear quite a lot that people will see the uh, the TED structure kind of co uh, conserved across different cell types, which is overall true, uh, especially in early stage in early stages when people are analyzing the uh, chromatin when analyzing the genome organization with uh, the relatively lower resolution of a high C technology. You will see a lot most of the TEDs are conserved across cell type. Um, because like many of the uh, TED boundaries are, are, are the same across cell type. And because of the lack of uh, enough resolution, you didn't see the difference be within the TEDs. But later, when we have more higher resolution technologies, one part is because of like, we are sequencing the, uh, um, um, this, um, for example, high C in a much deeper way. And the other one is when we have more higher resolution uh, genome organization uh, technologies, we see more cell, cell type specific um, genome organization pattern. For example, here I'm giving two examples on from, one from the uh, MRLID cell, which is a lung fibroblast cell. Um, the other one is GM12878, which is a B lymphocyte cell. They are look, we're looking at the same location, chromosome two. Um, so you will see a very different uh, genome organization pattern. So um, in MRLID cell, you will see a very strong, um, I guess you can see my mouse here. Um, I can use it as a pointer. Um, um, so in I'm a uh, cell, there's a very strong uh, uh, chromatin accessibility signal here, uh, which is absent in the GM12878 signal. And this, um, this uh, cluster of uh, ataxic signal or uh, accessibility signal is leading to a strong interaction pattern with the, with the uh, digital um, uh, DNA elements, which also occupied by the uh, by the CDC binding and the uh, ATX signal. So th this clearly showed the um, cell type specific uh, genome organization feature. This is not the end of it. Like later, there are um, more higher resolution chromatin organization technologies, such as uh, micro C. One key feature of the micro C technology is it use a micrococa uh, nuclease, which gives you a much shorter carding of the DNA. So then to enable the, uh, the proximate ligation in a much higher resolution. And when you sequence a, a, a micro C uh, on uh, results, you will see a higher resolution. For example, here, this, this plot um, on the left, it's a, um, it's a contact matrix, matrices heat map and the five kilo base resolution. And the zoom in part is two kilo base resolution. And when we compare the uh, human embryonic stem cell with the uh, HFF uh, C6, which is a fibroblast cell line, 
you will clearly see within the tags, there are multiple um, cell types specific regulate and prompting interactions, such as in the embryonic stem cell, you see more, oh, you see more, um, on, uh, you see more interaction within this pet, but it's absent in the fibroblast. So uh, I want to, uh, I hope you are convinced that between cell types, there are many more higher resolution chromatin interaction so, that are cell type specific. And these are the um, very important for gene regulation. It's very important for us to understand such as enhancer promoter interaction. We need this kind of high resolution and technologies. So, um, but um, the, the, I mentioned to you high C technology uh, and also the micro C technology. These are great help, uh, helping us to understand the, not only the overall architecture of the genome, but also the very fine scale genome organization. But these technologies really have um, very strong technical limitations. So I'm gonna lay out a few limitations of this technology and why we need the um, machine learning approaches, predictive mode approaches can enable us to solve these challenges. So first, on um, this, um, this experimental technology usually requires a large number of cells to the minimum of like thousands, usually it's millions of cells, which means your, your analyzed signal is average across these cells. So um, basically we, um, we cannot detect the cell, uh, uh, single cell variance, uh, single cell heterogeneity of this chromatin interaction. And also because they require that large number of uh, cells, so what, um, it's going to be very challenging to analyze uh, a rare cell types, such as those in the primary tissue. So um, the second part is um, um, this technology is because it's um, it's the direct readout of this technology is the physical um, um, physical distance in the nucleus. So um, basically, it does not tell you what kind of interaction it is, whether it's a it's a transcription induced and chromatin interaction or more a architectural or structural kind of interaction. We, we basically don't know. It just tell you the uh, interaction frequency. You need, you need something that can, uh, some additional information to tell you the difference between the different types of chromatin interaction. And the third, which is um, more obvious, but I want to really emphasize it, these technologies are like resource and uh, labor consuming. Really, it takes like multiple days and uh, requires a very um, deep sequencing. Really, um, people recommend like uh, sequencing 30 eggs of the whole genome, which is around 100, 100 gigabytes of the data for a single sample. Th this like labor and resource consume, um, uh, requirement for this for the technology makes it impractical for a large scale uh, studies. Like if you search the public data, um, the, the, um, the cell types then that have the high C data available, it's like very few. And um, when you want to do the perturbation or mechanistic study of uh, DNA elements in genome fertilization, it's gonna be very challenging to apply it to the large scale studies. Um, so uh, I want to elaborate this question further because um, in many cases, when we are studying the genome uh, gene regulation, you want to uh, understand whether a DNA element is important for a specific regulation. For example, here within the TED, there are multiple CDCF uh, binding. Whether the, uh, the, the CDCF binding in the middle of the TEDs are important for the genome organization or not. One straightforward thing you want to study is you want to perturb it to see whether it's important for the local prominent organization. So uh, you want to use a CRISPR-based technology to uh, perturb it, either delete or mutate or uh, whichever you define. Um, and you want, you want to introduce this perturbation and assuming the CRISPR technology works well in this specific context. Then you will perform the chromatin confirmation capture on uh, technology, for example, HiSE or um, other technologies before and after this perturbation. And you compare the results and see whether this perturbation is causing a big change. Then you will evaluate whether the uh, analyzed DNA elements is important or not. So this is uh, for experimentalists, uh, it's gonna be a, uh, a big chunk of work and you uh, it was gonna possibly take you at least a month if you are doing it fast. Uh, so then to do this kind of analysis. And also uh, I'm not only talk, not even talking about the, uh, the cost for doing these experiments. So this is not the end. Uh, when, you, when we want to analyze like uh, what kind of DNA elements are important for the uh, genome organization, um, we want to do a screen experiments. So a genetic screen is you want to unbiasedly analyze all the DNA elements. 
in, in the genome. And it's almost, it's pretty much impossible to work with the experimental technology. Like you want to do system, systematically perturbation of the genome and then measure them for every individual perturbation and then see which DNA element is important. So it's impossible with the experiments. Um, this is even not the end because across different cell types, because of the different uh, transacting proteins and their uh, different chromatin background. So DNA element is important in cell type A, may not be uh, important for cell type B. So there, um, so um, this, this really generates the differential in, in sociality of DNA elements in determining the chromatin interaction. So like all this, um, all these limitations make it pretty much impossible to do it in experiments. So one, strip, uh, one uh, motivation is, what if we could do all these perturbation experiments um, in silico? Like this will require a good model that can model the uh, genome organization through a de novo prediction. De novo, I mean, there, uh, for a specific cell type, you barely have, you don't have the uh, high, CD, high C type of data available. So you want to do it in de novo and to ensure that the application can be applied to uh, all different cell types. And it has to be have a high accuracy and this like comparable to the high quality uh, experimental data so that to enable you uh, to make the data, uh, data interpretable when you do the actual um, analysis and interpretation. It has to be cell type specific so that to distinguish the differential uh, essentiality of DNA elements in different cell types. So with this, uh, with this goals, we, you know, we propose to use um, machine learning based uh, approaches that can enable, us, um, enable a de novo prediction of the genome organization. So recently we are uh, collaborating with Jimmy Tan, who, uh, who is a graduate student at NYU and also my roommate who I was uh, during my PhD in uh, NYU and collaborating with uh, Aris uh, Dragos, uh, he's a professor at NYU. So we propose this model uh, to do cell type specific prediction of the genome organization and using that as a tool to do in silico genetic screen for discover a uh, genome organization. I'm gonna lay out how we, uh, how we develop these tools and how we use this tool for discovering a uh, new genome organization regulation. Um, so um, when we want it to be cell type specific, we require some uh, key information. Of course, we need the cell type specific information, which is usually from the, from the chromatin. So we, we incorporate some uh, cell type specific chromatin uh, signals. And one important thing is the DNA sequence, because the DNA sequence itself has a lot of in, you know, critical information, such as uh, um, the CDC finding and their uh, binding site orientation. These are very important information for um, determining the genome organization. So we process this um, this model uh, this this input information because there are different types of information in in different uh, encoders, then can, uh, different um, encoder with a convolutional neural, neural network. So for the DNA um, and the chromatin information, they are processed separately and then uh, 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 concatenated together and processed by a transformer module to learn the digital interaction of, of the uh, DNA elements and using a, a specific decoder that can. Um, decode the uh, learned information from the transformer module and predict the results as a uh, 2D interaction, uh, interaction map, um, uh, exactly like the experimental high C map. So um, we trained the model with, uh, with, different, uh, with different data. Um, actually, we uh, work with the, uh, train the model in a two megabase window and using a uh, bean size of uh, eight kilobase on Per, uh, or eight kilobase as a resolution. So here we are using the data from rmr 90 cell on uh, using most of the chromosome uh, from rmr 90 cell as a training data, we're using chromosome randomly selected chromosome 10 as a validation during, during training and uh, chromosome 15 data as a, as a test. So when we are choosing um, the input information, there are multiple ways. You know, like, um, many of the chromatin information, they are cell type specific. And um, they, uh, so we want to find out the best way to do the prediction. So we include the DNA sequence, we include the ataxic signal, and also the uh, CDC binding, which is uh, possibly or arguably the most important uh, uh, information for determining the genome organization. So we train them uh, 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 with this, uh, with this uh, C origami model with uh, different combinations of the input information. 
and try to find what's the best uh, way to, uh, what's the best result we could achieve. So here we use a validation loss, uh, loss and the, as a metric to evaluate the different models. So uh, obviously we'll see at the bottom line on um, the, the model trained with DNA sequence with ATAC-6 signal and the CDC finding profile achieved the best performance. So we use this, uh, this uh, model with uh, DNA sequence, CDCF and chromatin accessibility as an input to do this de novo prediction of genome organization. So um, uh, has, uh, to have a first glimpse of how the model perform. So we, uh, again, we use, uh, we use data from iMyLID cell where we use most of the data for training. Chromosome two is one of the training data. Um, the first line is the experimental data and the bottom line is the uh, predicted results and um, CDCF and ATAC signal are uh, added to the bottom. So you will see in chromosome 10 validation, chromosome uh, 15 uh, test data, you will clearly see that the model predicted the high resolution uh, uh, results of the, all the chromatin interaction features, including the, such as those dots, the chromatin loops, um, and also more uh, the tech, tech domain structure. Uh, very, uh, very com comparable to the to this high uh, to this high quality uh, high C data. So uh, we um, we want to evaluate this uh, performance quantitatively. So we calculate the, uh, a uh, data called in insulation score, which basically um, test what uh, for individual DNA elements how uh, insulated they are compared with the laboring um, chromatin domain. So um, the lower insulation score, which means they are more separated um, compared with um, the laboring and DNA elements. So um, you will see the experimental, um, the uh, insulation scores calculated from the experimental data are very um, close to the, um, the predicted results and a very high correlation score. And you will see most of the, uh, most of the DNA elements, most of the uh, DNA windows are have a higher, a very high um, correlation between the uh, insulation scores from experiment and prediction. So this is uh, like the uh, first glimpse of the performance in the cell type we trained the model. How about like when we want it to be cell type specific and de novo prediction, how this performance will be like. So uh, again, we use the data from MRLID and we predict the uh, results from a different cell type where the model have never seen their input or target information from the GM12878 uh, cell line. And the chromosome two locus and the experimental data is very different from each other. And the, the deep, on the right side is a difference map between these two cell types. And bottom here the, is the ex, uh, predicted results. You will see clearly the model captured the very on uh, the cell type specific uh, chromatin interaction on uh, features. And the difference between the predicted results matches perfectly with the experimental difference. So this gives a very good indication that the model is performing well for the de novo prediction and in a cell type specific manner. Uh, uh, to give you more example, uh, we applied the model to more cell, uh, three more um, uh, new cell types in a de novo prediction uh, scenario. Um, and again, top line is experimental data and bottom line is a predicted results. Um, so, um, um, and, and then we calculate the insulation score for uh, for each cell, uh, for each cell type and um, put it into a this um, correlation coefficient score here. You will see and the diagonal of this uh, of this um, uh, uh, you will see and the diagonal the the predicted results insulation score matches perfectly with the experimental data and they are, uh, they have a much lower correlation coefficients uh, across cell types indicating the, um, the model captured the cell type specific uh, features across different uh, cell types. Um, um, we also want to benchmark how the model, yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. So mm -hmm. when uh, does your training data have multiple cell types? Um, our training data only use one the data from one cell type. So how do you think, because uh, if the model only sees one cell type, then how could it generalize to new cell types, even though you provide that information, the model mm -hmm. will choose to ignore it, right? Because it, it's only one cell type in the tree. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. So like on um, the cell type specific in, in, in chromatin interaction, definitely there's like, um, there, um, there's like the grammar underlying their uh, chromatin interaction, such as their chromatin background, CTC binding or chromatin accessibility. Um, these are like important for, the, for their uh, kind of determining the, um, 
genome interaction, quantum interaction. So um, it, for a model that can detect this kind of cell type specificity, it has to learn this, uh, this grammar to learn from the chromatin background and then make the prediction. So clearly uh, we think our model learns the, uh, this grammar. Like um, you, you just learn from this single cell type that uh, what kind of chromatin background, background will feed to the model and what kind of target information they can, they can predict. And they learn the regulation between the 1D chromatin information to the 2D interaction matrices. And then this grammar can be learned applied to the same uh, to other cell types of human. Please. Now you follow up questions. So why why you do not start with multiple cell type from the beginning? Um, that's a good point. Uh, I think uh, a second version of this model we definitely can mm, can do that. Um, uh, um, I think in the end of my presentation, I have one slide to talk about um, how we can improve this model. But as a proof of principle, we didn't really apply it to large scale um, um, model training. It's just like um, based on, um, that's actually the good part of this model. Is you, use, you just use the data from one cell type and uh, you divide the data of the, this cell type into two megabase windows. It gives you like around, uh, 5,000 or 6,000 of data point, data like training data unit. Um, and it already learns the, uh, the learns a grammar of chromatin genome organization and makes a very good prediction. So I guess this, this is the beauty of this, um, of this model. So uh, I'm pretty sure that when we train the model with higher quality data, with more data, it will make the model performance be much even better. Yeah. The single cell um, cell type specific uh, expression level. For example, if we can use, for example, uh, whole blood has more available expression data. Mm -hmm. If we just use that one, that that data, whole blood expression data, and mm -hmm. then we plus cell specific elements like what you did, do you think we can do cell type specific expression prediction? Um, that's a very good point. Um, I think and. The because like you know, for all the study, when we, you know, when we want to understand the chromatin interaction, the ultimate goal is want to translate their regulation into gene expression regulation. For example, what kind of DNA elements are contributing to a cell type specific gene expression? So that's definitely you know, what, what exactly what we are doing right now. Want to translate this chromatin interaction information to gene expression regulation. That's gonna be very straightforward. Um, um, I mean, straightforward not, 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 doesn't mean it's easy. So we, we're having quite some uh, technical issues. Um, but in the, uh, a very basic, uh, uh, very straightforward um, uh, like application is how we can um, translate this chromatin interaction into a specific gene regulation mechanism. Like we, then we can use that, that interaction um, uh, in, uh, like intermediate information to really um, predict uh, the gene expression in a cell type specific scenario. So uh, yeah, easy way is like we are working on it. And I think we have one more question. Okay, yeah. um, so um, as a benchmark of, um, so there, there are a few recent models that use uh, DNA sequence to, uh, and also use deep, deep, neural, uh, deep neural network to predict the genome organization on uh, three famous one is Akita and DeepSea and uh, uh, Orca. Uh, here, so they use DNA sequence as a, uh, as an input information, which makes the model being very sensitive DNA to DNA sequence, and then to predict the genome, uh, genome organization. So we want to see how our model compared with this uh, this current models. Um, so um, so uh, to give a first impression, um, because this this three uh, sequence based model they use uh, only DNA sequence, which means they don't have the cell type specific information for their prediction, um, um, and then they, they can still make a prediction because they are trained with the with the sequence and do, um, make a prediction. Which means when you have this DNA sequence, it will pretty much give you the same uh, prediction. So um, so. And based on its design, um, it won't be able to capture the cell type specific specificity. So, for example, here um, in imr 90 cell uh, versus a GM12878, you will see clearly they are very different from, um, from mm, mm, in the experimental data. And the uh, C origami model captured this cell type specific um, difference. But for the uh, for the sequence based model, it will give you a 
uh, uh, high resolution prediction, but it may not reflect the actual chromatic interaction because it doesn't detect the cell type specific um, information. And this, uh, we have multiple more uh, cases like this. Um, and uh, in many cases, this, this sequence-based model are generating uh, false positive results, which might mislead to our gene regulation studies. So um, we further captured, uh, we further can, can, can calculate the insulation score of this, this model prediction results and see how, <clears throat> uh, what to evaluate the, the performance of these models. You'll clearly see the uh, C algorithm model prediction results gives a much higher uh, correlation coefficients in terms of the uh, insulation scores compared with the other uh, sequence-based models. So uh, I guess here, uh, so far I've convinced you that the C origami model is uh, giving a very uh, high resolution prediction of the genome organization. And we want to see how we can use this predictive model to um, discover new regulation of genome organization. Um, and don't forget, like in the beginning, our goal to set up this uh, project is to enable our high throughput, uh, uh, high throughput uh, genetic, in silico perturbation and screening approach to discover the new uh, genome organization regulation. So a few applications I'm gonna quickly go through. Like we are predicting the results in two megabase window on um, which uh, you might wonder like how we can expand this, uh, this prediction results to a larger scale. So because the model is uh, captures the uh, uh, chromatic interaction in two megabase window, we can do, uh, what we can do is do overlap prediction and uh, assemble them um, uh, after the prediction in a larger chromatic window. So here we have assembled the chromatic interaction up to like 550 uh, megabase. Um, you will clearly see the uh, experimental results and the prediction are uh, having a very good correlation um, between each other. And further, um, in cancer genomes, there are a lot of like uh, chromosomal rearrangements. They might generate the different uh, chromatin organization. Um, for example, here in cuttle one, which is a um, TCL and lymphoblastic leukemia cell line, they have a chromosome seven to chromosome nine translocation, and they form a new chromatin. Um, when we might map the experimental high C data to a custom reference genome where you simulate this uh, um, translocation, they form a new um, TED domain where um, the chromosome seven and chromosome nine are fusing together. And there's a uh, interesting feature then the, from chromosome nine, um, a, uh, a stripe as, uh, as extending from chromosome nine to chromosome seven. This indicates a new regulation. So when we apply this, uh, uh, this uh, tr translocation case to the uh, say origami, say origami model, you'll clearly see uh, it predicted this uh, domain and also this high resolution um, stripe that extending from chromosome nine to chromosome seven. Just a good question. So when, when you're building this prediction, do you have the ATAC seq and CTCF for this new cell line, or have you just changed the sequence? Yeah, because the, this this input chromatin information, uh, we um it's more like uh, to the local chromatin states. So we just measure the uh the cell type their their uh, ATAC seq signal and the CTCF binding signal. And then you uh, use that information in the custom reference data and do the prediction. So it will give you, uh, then we can clearly predict this uh, TED domain and the translocation side. Um, so that's in the cell line without the translocation, you use the, or with um, the Because the cell line itself already has a translocation. So all the chromatin feature is already in there. So when you map it and then you will detect those signal and we use that signal to bridge them in silico and then do the prediction. So uh, another feature, because we used a transformer module, which, uh, which has a self, uh, uh, self attention mechanism that can detect, um, gives you a first layer of uh, which DNA elements or which chromatin feature are uh, contributing significantly to the, to the genome organization. So um, for example, um, uh, here are two cases where the attention score are, capture, uh, are capturing the uh, key chromatin interaction features you will see all these scores are um, correlating to the key interaction elements. That gives you the first, first uh, layer of screen, which DNA element might be important for this local chromatin organization. Um, okay, so come back to the early question, how we can do the perturbation and discover the new uh, chromatin organization signal. So we want to do the acyclical perturbation. Um, as a first example, like here, um, we want to perturb a DNA sequence and then see uh, whether a DNA sequence co is causing a um, 
in demand fusion event. For example, here before the before the deletion um, and after the deletion, you will see a strong uh, again of uh, community interaction signal at this uh, area. And clearly, when you when you can, when you visualize it in a, a difference map, you will see the chromatic interaction gain and this um, locus, which indicates a previously insulated DNA domain are interacting in a higher frequency um, between these two insulated domain. So apply this, uh, we can apply this uh, in silico perturbation across a, uh, in, uh, across a whole window in a saturated uh, way. So what we do here, uh, the perturbation, we choose a simple way to do the perturbation. We just delete everything, the DNA and the chromatin background, and then calculate the difference map. To, uh, and this difference map will end up with a impact score, which uh, a higher impact score indicates a bigger change of the chromatin interaction. So for every DNA element, we can calculate this um, uh, impact score and visualize it. So we'll see the impact score and this uh, two megabase window, it clearly captures uh, um, uh, the key chromatin interaction uh, elements. Uh, for example, here, when you uh, uh, delete this DNA elements, it gives you a very high impact score that indicates a, a strong chromatin, a strong TED, um, uh, TED fusion events between the uh, between the insulated uh, TEDs. So when we apply this in silico perturbation across the whole genome, basically we um, perturb every single base in the human genome. But practically, we delete uh, hundred sorry delete uh, one kilo base this kind of resolution, uh, one element by one element for the whole genome. And then we can identify the uh, impact for DNA elements across the genome. And using a data science approach to group the, to uh, analyze these you know, DNA elements, we group this uh, impact for DNA elements into four groups based on their presence or absence of the CDCF binding and the ATAC6 signal. You will see um, group one is the one that uh, co occupied by CDCF and uh, also have a strong ATAC6 signal. Um, and interestingly, the group three is a one which does not have a um, does not have a um, CDC binding, but a very strong uh, chromatin uh, accessibility signal. So these results, um, uh, we can uh, associate this uh, impact for DNA elements based on their uh, uh, genome annotation. For example, the, the promoter enhancer gene body or TED boundary or intergenic region. So we'll see very interesting in the group three where there's no CDC, but very strong ATAXX signal. They have a very high, uh, uh, high fraction uh, high, very high enrichment to the promoter or enhancer. Actually, around 80% of these DNA elements are actually promoter or enhancer. So this indicates a very strong transcription-associated uh, chromatin interaction that, uh, that determines the chromatin uh, interaction maps that we see from the experimental HiC data. So uh, previously, um, previously um, people defined mass as a uh, as a protein that, uh, that act as a CDCF, in, CDCF dependent uh, genome organization regulator. It's a new, uh, uh, it's kind of a new archit architectural protein. So we find, uh, we find here actually when, when, we, uh, when we use the impact, impact for elements and analyze that with the uh, mass, mass chip seq data, we find that mass are enriched much higher in the uh, CDCF uh, in a, a CDCF independent way, like they only mm, map to the uh, open chromatin region, but they have a much higher uh, enrichment to the um, to the CDCF uh, independent uh, in, uh, independent uh, open chromatin region. So this indicates that mass might be a new uh, uh, chromatin uh, organization regulator, but independent of uh, CDCF. So um, with this information, we want to identify more cell type specific uh, regulation of uh, chromatin organization. And we perform the in silico gelet screen across different cell types. As a proof of principle, we applied this to uh, leukemia cell lines and also compared it with the normal uh, cell type. Um, so on the top panel, it's an impact score of uh, different cell types and the bottom is an uh, input signal. So we find uh, interestingly in the gene quartz uh, CHD4, um, they have a, um, we found a impact, uh, impactful element in only in the T cell, but not in the uh, leukemia cell lines. So, um, they, uh, and when we analyze their input information, when we visualize the input information, we find that in the, um, in the T cell, they have a CDCF binding and this DNA elements, which indicates that 
Um, in T cell, they have a CD safe binding, which insulates the, uh, the interaction between the left uh, DNA elements and the uh, and DNA elements on the right. But in leukemia, there's an absence of this uh, CD safe binding, indicates a loss of insulation. And this loss of insulation actually is uh, clearly visualized from the uh, experimental data. So we'll see on the uh, top right uh, panel is a, a T cell high C map, and the bottom left is a, a leukemia uh, cell line. You will see clearly um, from this uh, from this area, um, the T cell does not have this interaction, but in the leukemia cell line, you will see a much stronger interaction indicating the loss of insulation of this element in the, uh, contributes to the, uh, the gain of interaction in leukemia cells. And this interaction may lead to the uh, uh, higher expression of CHD4 in leukemia cells compared with the uh, normal uh, T cells. So um, to um, go further with this is uh, CHD4, we followed with the uh, uh, CRISPR uh, lockout screen and found that CHD4 itself is, a, uh, uh, is in critical for the T cell uh, proliferation. This indicates that CHD4 might be a uh, leukemia target, then we can control the cell proliferation rate as a way to uh, for uh, leukemia therapeutics. So um, go further from the uh, DNA elements, like the impact for DNA elements, which are uh, important in a uh, uh, function in a cell type specific scenario. One further way we want to identify is a uh, proteins in uh, regulating the genome organization. So when we identify the cell type specific impact for DNA elements, we can do the enrichment analysis uh, with the existing uh, transcript factor binding profile and see which, uh, which, DNA, uh, which proteins are enriched in the uh, specific cell type. So uh, applying this uh, uh, transacting factor inference across these three cell types, clearly we see um, um, the, uh, the highly enriched uh, proteins that are important for chromatin organization. So you will, uh, you will imagine that uh, for the most important ones like CDCF or cohesion complexes, they're important in every cell type. They can be captured in like all cell types, and it is uh, results clearly capture those uh, shared uh, DNA, uh, shared uh, proteins that are important for genome organization in all the cell types. But interestingly, we also find the cell type specific uh, regulator. Uh, for example, on um, this group of uh, uh, protein factors are um, uh, are highly enriched in the T cell, and the third group is more enriched in the leukemia cells. This and this gives us. Um, better resource to uh, as follow-up study to uh, how we can use this uh, silicon delay screen discovered um, new regulators to discover the cell type specific or disease specific uh, new regulator as a way for us to understand the um, disease specific regulation. So um, uh, I um, go through like how we can use the silicon delay screen to do discover how we can further develop this. So one part is our current study is uh, are working with a two megabase window in an eight kilobase resolution. But in the in actual world, like when we want to study the gene regulation, ideally, we want, we want it to be as high, uh, as high resolution as possible. So um, even like to the, to the uh, for example, hundreds of uh, base pair or up to the single base, uh, single base resolution. So how we can develop a high resolution select screen, uh, select screen approach to uh, truly enable our cell type specific uh, gene regulation study and how we can uh, target the, the different types of perturbation. In the, uh, in the profile principle here, we use deletion, but can we simulate the, um, the mutation, the indels, the sleeps, or the epigenetic changes of the um, chromatin background? And based on this in, in silico gelet screen results, how we can uh, experimentally validate these results to discover new uh, genome organization regulation and disease specific regulation. Um, one, further, uh, pro, uh, one further direction we are approaching right now is how we can translate this uh, study to single cell uh, genome organization study. Just now Roche gave a very good example of uh, the cell types, uh, single cell uh, heterogeneity of genome organization. How we can use a global prediction of single cell uh, data to study their genome organization. This will really unlock the gene regulation um, to possibly all the human cell types. And um, go beyond the genome organization, how we can use this um, machine learning predictive tool to study other um, genome, um, genomic features, such as um, 
gene expression, uh, such as uh, epigenetic regulation of the background of the chromatin. So these are all exciting questions we are approaching right now. And with this, I would like to thank my uh, collaborator, Jimin uh, Aris, and uh, other collaborators. And I'm setting up my group here and the uh, gene regulation of the beta on the sixth floor. I'm happy to take more questions. Um, fantastic talk. That was this is really exciting work. Um, really exciting. So I have a question about you mentioned um, that you were working on uh, predicting gene expression levels, and uh, or something along these lines. And I wonder, wonder if you could just talk a little bit more about this. I know there's been some existing work on predicting, um, like expecto predicting gene expression levels from sequence data, and informer predicting regulatory elements. Um, but my impression had been that like the ability to predict sort of, you know, which regulatory elements uh, map to which genes has been like a real missing link that mm -hmm. those methods haven't been able to do. I don't know, can you just talk a little bit more about uh, what, you're, what you're working on in this area? Yeah, so um, you mentioned about like uh, Informer and I think there are a few other models that can, the one aiming to nerf on the DNA sequence feature and then see whether those are a uh, key feature underlying a gene expression regulation. So those are great. I think we are also learning from their model to how we can maximize the information we can learn from DNA sequence. So in our in our case, we want to add the key information as a cell type specific feature. So DNA sequence is still a core part of the model, um, but we want to add like some cell type specific feature such as um, uh, ATAC-seq, which is a fairly uh, uh, easily um, uh, fairly easy obtainable. Uh, in the cell type specific feature. So uh, what we are trying to do right now is to learn on the yeah. DNA sequence and some cell type specific feature to predict the genome organization in a high resolution. Uh, because the gene, mm, there are multiple uh, experimental uh, studies, uh, like mm, look at the, because usually a gene is uh, interacting with multiple enhancers and they are contributing kind of in a linear way uh, to the gene expression. So. If we can use uh, um, input information such as DNA sequence and ATAC signal, signal and predict the intermediate information as a chromatin interaction in a high resolution, we can possibly have a chance to um, really do a, a cell type specific chromatin interaction map and using that to predict the gene expression. I think it's going to achieve a much better performance compared with the sequence, uh, sequence only models. Because there, here, we are really uh, trying to aim for the bona fide chromatin interaction underlying gene regulation. So that's going to be, I think that's going to be the key part for, um, for the high resolution prediction of gene expression. Thanks. Yeah. Um, hey, thanks for the talk. Um, so I'll just ask two questions. One, you looked at kind of uh, what I would call first order perturbations in the genome. What, what do you think would happen if you looked at second order? So if you looked at perturbing, you know, multiple one kilobase sites. And um, could you validate that easily experimentally? So that's that's the first question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll ask the second after your answer. Okay, yeah, and that's, and that's, and that's a very interesting question. Um, so um, currently we are doing a kind of simpler proof of principle, just delete everything. So um, I think there are two parts. So um, when you're asking first order or second order, I thought I, I I thought it was a different question. Like, uh, for example, when uh, when we are doing the per uh, perturbation, we actually assume the uh, perturbation only affect this that local chromatin background. We didn't evaluate whether uh, a local chromatin background will induce any uh, secondary effect. Like, you know, for example, it, it might affect a key. Um, let's say it might affect the uh, expression of CTCF in a very specific case. But this will cause a secondary effect of uh, remodeling the chromatin or organization. We, we, we assume most of the DNA element perturbation will not cause a strong effect, which, uh, which is, um, I mean, we are aware of this uh, assumption, but um, in most cases, it won't generate this strong secondary effect. Um, so um, yeah, we just uh, evaluate their impact on the local chromatin interaction as a, um, just a straightforward uh, impact. So in terms of like multi-way uh, perturbation, so um, we, we didn't try that uh, in our uh, proof of principle analysis, but I think technically it's definitely durable. Like you, when you remove multiple uh, DNA elements and see how the chromatin organization will change 
in a local uh, two megabits window. I think it will, as long as we um, like simulate the input information, the model will still give a, uh, give a predicted results based on the grammar that uh, it has learned. But how it will, in that case, uh, I guess the secondary effect might be uh, even bigger. So um, I guess have to be careful in terms of interpreting the results, even though the model itself, well, just based on its grammar will make the prediction, but you have to be careful with the interpreting interpretation. Okay, yes. just on sorry, last question. <laughs> um, so you just, you have some experimental data like ATAX and Kego and team that uh, it's assumed to be an input to your model. Yep. Um, how expensive is it to get that data? Um, so experiment wise. Uh -huh. So we currently use two um, experimental data, the ATAX and the CDCF. So um, it, um, compared with high C data, it's around like one tenth of the cost. Um, but still, like we require two, which is not as uh, easy. So we're trying to <clears throat> we're trying to even reduce a two uh, cell type specific feature to one because you need one uh, cell type specific. Uh, I, I, I think this one very likely to be ATAXIC signal uh, pioneered by Jason Boyer Rostow and Roche's current mentor. It's like becoming a very um, um, arguably possibly the easiest uh, genomic feature that you could get for a cell type. Um, so um, when we learn from the, uh, from the ATAXIC signal, can we like um, build an intermediate prediction of CDCF binding then to remove the actual CDCF binding profile in our prediction? I think that's gonna be a uh, great way to improve this model and to reduce uh, uh, the cost of uh, input feature. This is fantastic. Well, I have two questions, follow up on Luke's question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned about informer. So my first question is um, for the informer, basically what you envision for your future work um, on expression prediction mm -hmm. is to have a better performed model but it's like better performed on, on top of informer because for informer is also a cell type. It also has a uh, cell type tissue type specific prediction. That's my understanding. So basically you are envision by adding on more information, adding another layer of prompting interaction mm -hmm. and you achieve better prediction for cell type specific expression prediction. Is that mm -hmm. what you envision for your future work? Yeah, I, I definitely, because um, one key part of a CR origami model is it learns a cell type specific uh, feature. Yeah. And clearly, like we see the, in those in those differences, cell type specific features being captured by the model. So um, just like all the uh, gene regulation, because when we are talking about expression of individual genes, those are very cell type specific. So I definitely uh, would um, like envision that the future uh, predictive model for gene expression Will, will capture this uh, type specificity. So on um, on the current like like informer model, it's not, I, I'm not questioning any of like it's it's a super cool tool and it's revolutionary for us to understand from the sequence to uh, expression and it's very sensitive to the sequence, but it does lack the cell type specificity because um it's more sensitive to the mutations for example um but uh, it will not like give you the uh, cell type. Like in, in, let's say in two cell types with the exact the same DNA sequence, they will not they will not give you two different expression level. So that's a uh, limitation. And clearly, if you get give them some um, cell type specific feature, it will enable the more precise regulation of gene expression or precise prediction of gene expression. So the second question is more technical. So. Um, I feel like you also have a convolution, um, convolutional neural net plus transformer, right? It's the similar as informer. My impression to informer is that it was computational in, um, intensive for model mm -hmm. development. How that was the case for your model? Uh, it's definitely like computational um, uh, intensive. Like when we're when we're doing this, I think one that's actually I think during the presentation you're also asking like how much input feature we are using for our prediction. That's actually also limited by this. So we are only training the data with uh, uh, for, uh with the data from one cell type. It's also because like um, as a proof of principle, we don't have that much of computation power to really expand to multiple cell types uh, as an input as a training data. Um, um, so it definitely like requires. Um, so in our actual training, 
Um, the RAM is like around 300 uh, giga, if I remember correctly. I guess oh, I have more like accurate number from the, from the our message section, but like it definitely it's a, it requires pretty uh, intensive um, uh, computation power during training. So um, and so that that like makes our training with the large scale data being kind of challenging. So we're trying to optimize how we can really reduce this computational requirement um, during training. But actually, after the training, it's gonna be very easy to run the model. You can basically can write in a laptop in a, within one or two seconds. It will give you a prediction. So, okay, thank you so much, uh, Bo. I think we'll uh, save any questions now for the discussion.